So it how really did you how did you create your audience? Because we were talking about product and commodity, words I don't necessarily like, but we're actually talking about a taste and fulfilling a taste and an appetite and an audience who wants to see Probably it. How did you from the ROM, right, pressing the tape recorder and having that nice little 15 minutes, actually go to create a fairly large international audience it wasn't that wants to see initially, but after we had grown to a certain point, once and again, it really was word of mouth. We could not afford to advertise in newspapers and that sort of thing. Because we were doing something that was new and innovative, we were frequently interviewed on the radio. We became a very, very interesting young couple in Toronto. We had lots of articles written about us in the newspaper, lots of photographs. It was an interesting sort of sexy thing to write about what we were doing. It was so strange, it was so weird, it was so... I don't know if anyone would have said innovative at the time, but it was Unusual, at any eccentric. <clears throat> but after a while, it was David Mervish, bless his heart, who phoned us out of the blue. We didn't know he had been coming to our shows. And he said, you people need a real theater. Why don't you come and talk with me? Because I think maybe I could do something for you. And David Alvis offered to put us on his season as an add-on. Because he was looking for something interesting, something that was... Uh, sophisticated, something that had a certain edge, and uh, he agreed that he would take over the advertising, the publicity. We'd give him the images, we'd still be able to stay absolutely true to sort of visually what, what we were trying to achieve, but that he in turn would use his mailing list, his advertising machine, and he basically said, look, I don't need to make any money on you, I'm not going to lose money, but I don't have to make money. This can be a break-even proposition. God uh, bless David Mervish. Yes, he yes. was very... One, we did two operas there. Can you imagine? And then we were ready to move on our own into the Elgin, yeah. which is such a beautiful place. I mean, the yeah. only reason we left the Royal Alex was, be, unfortunately, top of music had to be under the stage. It's how the pit is made. And so we end up having a period orchestra and we're using the sort of speakers you have at a rock concert to get the sound out into the audience. It was so counterproductive. But what David did for us was probably one of the most important things anyone ever did for us, prior to Anne Roberts sort of saying, I'll make yep. an announcement. Yes. And, and you just Other than her, this. yes. And of course, Mark Minkowski, who took us on a, a very famous French conductor, yeah. who saw our work and took us on a European tour, including BBC Proms, uh, Versailles, Switzerland, Germany. And how did he see you? How did Mark see you? We actually hired him to conduct. He, uh, somebody had, I think Jean Lamont from Tuffle Music recommended him. Yeah, it was she? Jennifer Smith. It ah. was our Queen of the Night. Okay. And she was his soprano of choice for recording at the time. And the thing is, these, these connections, I think if you keep focusing on what you're doing and have, if I can say it without sounding like we're patting ourselves on the back, you, an integrity. You want, you, you, don't, you, try, you don't veer from what you think is right for you in terms of sort of aesthetically or artistically. You start to attract people who feel the same way or people who recognize that and they want to experience it or be part of it. Our singers and Tafel Music in particular, Tafel Music already had an international reputation. They frequently had players who came from Europe, who came from the States, who would come and join them for our production. Those players would talk to other players. Those players would talk with singers. We ended up hiring a Queen of the Night, sight unseen, one of the only times we had ever done that, but we had heard a recording of her. And uh, she came and sang for us and said, there's a young conductor who you have to meet. He's absolutely astonishing. And use my name and get in touch with Mark Minkowski and his orchestra, Les Musiciens de Louvre. And Mark was just taking off at that time. He's become a, a huge star in Europe now. And Mark came to Toronto. He couldn't believe that such a company existed in North America. He was just overwhelmed. He conducted our Figaro, our Don Giovanni. And Dido and Aeneas, and which Dido went and Aeneas, on. Yes. We started in Houston. Houston yeah. had invited Opera Italia, actually, with yes. him. But then he, in turn, invited us for this wonderful European tour. And then he asked us to come and become principal instructors at the Center for Baroque Studies at Versailles for three years. That's well, we the other thing that blew me away. Yeah. The fact yeah. that a Canadian <laughs> Baroque Opera Company should go to Versailles yeah. to it teach. Was, it was That's, amazing. Uh, it's because we've specialized yeah. Yeah. in it, yeah. and I guess it's, it is quite unusual. 
We've also been to Germany Quite. several times. Who else has done it, yeah. Jeanette? Yes, yeah. and luckily we can actually make a living at it, and it's so we've really been able to yeah. give 100% of our time to it. But invariably, people are attracted to the fact that it is... I think they're, they're attracted to the passion of the company, and not just us, all of the people who are involved with the company. The singers who come and are frequently paid less than what they're paid when they work with other companies, and yet have a more rigorous rehearsal process. The singers, the dancers, the instrumentalists, I think that it has become a, uh, artistically a, um, something, of, um, something that's refreshing for people when they come to us and work with us. And consequently, that starts to, that starts to translate outside of the company itself, but to presenters, to funders. When we were at Versailles uh, teaching there, we were given a letter of introduction to the director of Foundation Paribas, which meant nothing to us whatsoever. French bank. A French bank. The French we bank. We did not even realize it wasn't the French bank. But <laughs> yes, someone in Toronto who represented Paribas had seen our production that you were in of Andromach, at the, where you played Orest for us. He and his wife came and saw that production at the, uh, the theater at Harbourfront. They literally ran into us with their baby carriage while Jeanette and I were buying some lunch at Harbourfront. And he said, you know, what you're doing is so extraordinary. If you're ever in Paris, here's my card. And just use it and ask to see Martine Treed and uh, tell her about what you're doing. We put the card away. We never thought we'd be in Paris. We never thought anything of it. But we kept the card. Shortly after that, we met Mark Minkowski. He started this whole thing of our working together, traveling together. And we were in Paris. and sent the card to Martine, or phoned her. Actually, our general manager phoned her. I, we both just hated meeting people that we didn't know, and it felt like it wouldn't go anywhere anyway. And Martine Treed gave us the address of the head office of Harry Bot and said that we could have a meeting. I was completely unprepared. I was wearing, if I remember correctly, shorts and running shoes and a t-shirt at the end of a very, very long day of rehearsal. And we walked into Perry Bar and we waited in the <laughs> orangery of the palace where Napoleon married Josephine in the center of the city. And Martine came out, this extraordinary woman, invited us into, a, uh, into an office and said, I've seen a great deal of Baroque opera here in Paris. I find it extremely boring. Tell me, how do you shake it up? Those are her exact words. And what was supposed to be a 45-minute meeting turned into, I think, two hours, two and a half hours. It was extraordinary. And she said, you know, if I do something for opera today, it's because I'm fascinated by you. I'm fascinated by you. And that was the last thing that she said. Unbeknownst to us, she came and attended some of the concerts that we were doing and staging at Versailles. We didn't know that she was attending. We received a letter in the mail, or our general manager did, saying that Perry Ba was making a donation of $110,000 to help underwrite the costs of Dido and Aeneas, and that they wanted to work with us and Mark Minkowski to set up a European tour the next year that would culminate in performances at the Chateau de Versailles in the Royal Opera House. Our general manager refused to even believe it. She just said, well, I'll believe it when I see it. This is just ridiculous. No one hands you $110,000 without some sort of strings attached. But that is what it was. And Perry Bar became our major donors. So let's talk about sponsorship a little, because yeah. again, that struck me as when a, a delicious creative of absurdity that your first major corporate sponsor came from a different country. Yeah. Had you tried to get corporate sponsors in Canada? Uh, oh, we had had some. We had had some. Uh, uh, Deutsche Bank, again, not, uh, not Canadian, but we've, Sun Life has been with us forever. Yeah, Sun right. Life has been just wonderful. Yes. Scotia um, Bank. BMO. BMO. Well, we have some very, very good sponsors here. And I must say, we had already been to Germany several times uh, and have been to Asia several times um, under the auspices of the Canadian government. They, gave, they used to give a lot of money, yeah. yes. uh, and it, gives, right up it gives Canada a presence yes. outside. Uh, it, uh, it gives Canada a really sophisticated cultural presence. I think I wish it would still go on. I think it's a big mistake for them not to. Yes. But no, we have, and yet, at the same time, the biggest sponsor ever, uh, especially at that time, 
was from France. Now, we, we do still receive funds from the Department of External Affairs. It's not that, well, you know, I mean, it's not that people have been cut off entirely. But there were avenues of funding that were open to us 15 years ago that are simply gone now, that, uh, that facilitated some very, very important and exciting touring and exchange of ideas. Um, with other artists, with other countries. Yes, we especially, well, Germany several times early on, and then Japan twice, Singapore, Korea mm -hmm. more than once. Yeah. And I, th Those we have invitations things. back everywhere, but they can't pick up the entire bill.